Hello and welcome to the video. In this video I'll be introducing you all to my honey beer. As usual I'll share the full recipe and all of the methods involved in it. I'm also going to explain how you can make this honey beer to precisely your own taste. But before I do that, let's have a little look at the history behind honey in beer. Honey beer, by the way, is certainly not to be confused with mead. Mead is simply water and honey. Honey beer has a long and illustrious history in the UK. As early as 5 AD, unhopped honey beer and mead were brewed by the father of the bride for the new couple to drink after their wedding. It was widely believed that the honey in these liquids actually helped the couple conceive their first baby and it was also responsible for why they call it a honeymoon. So there you go. The other rather nice thing about honey beer, particularly if you compare it to mead, is that most people actually seem to enjoy it. So that's a rather nice thing. Okay, so let's now have a quick look at this recipe. Here is my recipe for honey beer. This recipe is repeated in the YouTube description and it's also stored on the Grainfather Recipe Tours cloud. Please do note that there are various parts of this recipe that can be changed depending on the person who's brewing its taste. So for example a honey beer could be sweet if you want it to be. It could also be very very dry and this tends to be the effect of adding honey to a beer but there are ways that we can counteract this during the brewing process also. So what I show you in this recipe is exactly what I'm going to do but I'll explain later on on how you can customize this to your entire taste. Before I go through the brewing process, I just want to talk a little bit about Grain Crush again. The reason for this is I've noticed that there have been various conversations recently on the various Grain Father Facebook groups uh, talking about Grain Crush and also things like using brew in a bag bags uh, in your mash. So here's one of the pictures that came up on one of the Facebook groups from one of the members. He said that he had to resort to wrapping the basket in a brew in a bag bag to keep the grain out of the boil. Let me point out that this is simply a case of incorrect grain crush. In this case, the user's grain is being ground way too finely. This is actually the flip side to the usual problem where people are experiencing bad efficiencies due to the grain crush being too coarse. Okay. So let's have a look at where we really need to be to avoid these different problems. It's absolutely vital that you get this right and you can see here what I'm using and the important thing to realize here is that it's not smashed to bits. There are still some of the kernels left and the husks aren't totally demolished. Now one of the things that also came up in these conversations on the Facebook groups is that a lot of the people were actually having their grain milled at a homebrew store. And some of them thought that, well, you know, okay, so the grain thrush is at fault, but this is how it is from my homebrew store, so what can I do about it? Well, I'll tell you exactly what you can do about it. You can inspect the grain as soon as you pick it up, and if it's incorrectly milled, you tell them that you're not willing to pay for that, and that you want it to be milled properly. This is the way to go forward for the future. I do hope that this added section in this video helps some of you. It's fair to say that homebrew stores can make mistakes, but when they make a mistake with Grain Crush, you certainly shouldn't have to pay for it. So, let's start mashing in then. When you're adding the grain at the first start of the brew, this is what we call doughing in or mashing in. And the trick here is to evenly distribute the grain as you pour it in and to stir it all in to ensure that every single part of that grain is actually wet. To start with, when you have a smaller amount of grain in your mash tun, you'll find that there won't be much resistance when you're stirring it in. 
But as time goes on and you add more and more grain, that resistance will start to increase. This is now the time to start focusing on stirring from not just the top, but the bottom and the middle also. We need to make sure that there are no clumps in our grain so that every single part of it is actually wet. Okay, so I've moved forward now. I'm now at the last part of actually stirring in this grain. So every single piece of grain has now been added and we should now have a porridge-like consistency. So again, you know, we're making sure that all of this is totally submerged and wet and really, you know, make sure there are no clumps at all. In my experience, this is one of the processes of brewing that beginners tend to rush. And I would certainly urge against this. This is one of the fundamentals that will actually measure the type of efficiency you're going to get from the brew. So don't rush it. Go slowly. Add the grain gradually and give it a good stir and break up as you go. Once you're fully satisfied with your mash, then it's time to put the top plate on. Do this by putting the plate all the way down into the grain. Once you feel that you've hit the main mass of grain, then give it a little lift up. This will in actually increase your efficiency. After this, you can remove the middle pipe, put in the overflow pipe, and then you're ready to add the glass lid and the uh, recirculation arm. As you can see me doing here, you can also add a sink strainer and this actually just filters out some of the loose pieces uh, within the recirculation. When you first start the mash process you will notice that there will be some overflow. That's okay, that's perfectly normal. There is no need to reduce the flow of your pump. You will find, as you can see here, that after a short time this will even out. Here we are a little bit further on in the mash and you can see that we've got those beautiful golden colours starting to develop within this very clear wort now. So I mentioned earlier that you can actually adjust this beer to your taste and the mash, particularly the mash temperature, is the first part that we can do that in. Mashing in in today's brewing is basically on a sliding scale between 60 and 70 degrees C. For the ease of explanation and understanding, I'm going to break this down into three temperature ranges. The first temperature range is what I'm going to call low mash-in temperatures. And this is between 60 to 62 degrees C or 140 to 143.6 degrees Fahrenheit. When you mash at this temperature, you're actually going for what we call a light body in the beer. Your wort will also be highly fermentable, so depending on the type of yeast you use, your beer will end up dry. On the flip side of low mash in temps, we now have high, and this is done at between 68 to 70 degrees C and 154.4 to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. The end result of this type of mashing will be a wort that isn't as fermentable and thus there will be some residual sugars left in the beer and again depending on the type of yeast you have you will actually be able to make a much sweeter beer by doing this. The other point is that your beer will have a heavier body. Smack bang in the middle of high and low is of course medium and here we have medium mash in temps which is basically 65 degrees C or 149 degrees Fahrenheit. What you will achieve by mashing at this level is a middle ground between the high and low that we just discussed. So this will be a medium body beer and a middle ground between a highly fermentable wort and a wort that has some residual sugar. So in effect this could go either way. You could go a bit drier with this using yeast and you could also go a bit sweeter by using different types of yeast. My personal preference is to have a slightly sweeter beer when it comes to a honey beer. So that's why I'm actually mashing at 68 degrees C. Alright, so because we don't have an awful lot of time left in this video, I'm just going to give some quick pointers on sparging rather than going through the whole thing. 
So here are my important points to a successful sparge. Do not rush, sparge by hand and sparge evenly on that top plate. So moving forward on again now and you can see we're now at the boil. So we've got all of this thick protein at the top here uh, which is a very foamy type substance and what we want to do before we start our boil timer is actually just uh, stir this in until we get a nice clear top on the beer. Of course it's not beer yet, it's wort, but um, I do like to forward think. So we're now quite clear on top and it's time to add the first hop addition. Not really a lot of hops that go into this beer. What we're actually trying to do, seeing as this is a honey beer, is showcase the honey rather than hops and malt. So you might think that because this isn't a hoppy beer that there's no point in doing a whirlpool, but that isn't true. So here I am setting up for the whirlpool by first pausing the timer uh, and actually um, using the boiling hot wort to sanitise my counterflow chiller. This is the first step in getting ready for actually whirlpooling those zero minute hops. This is of course just a 12 litre brew and there isn't really much in the way of zero minute hops in this one but even so it's worth doing a whirlpool just to get all those flavours in place. Also let's not forget that this is a pump based system and as such you must whirlpool. It's the law. So here I did a five minute whirlpool. I then gave it, gave it a rest for five minutes before then actually um, taking the wall out via the counterflow chiller. By whirlpooling in this way and doing a stand you are really protecting yourself against having a stuck pump. But say the worst does happen, what else can you do? This fantastic tip comes all the way from New Zealand, from a very nice guy called Brian Livingston, who is actually the general manager of Brewers Corp in Auckland, New Zealand. Brian advised that by connecting this large plunger to the end of the wall out, you can literally push the excess hops on the filter completely off, thus giving you no further problems. What a great tip. Moving forward again now, we're almost at the end of this brew. I just need to put a little bit more of this wort into my fermentation bucket. So the next characteristic that can actually affect this beer in terms of its dryness is actually the yeast that we use. And if you look at the various different strains that I've laid out here, you'll see that they all have very, very different effects. So the M44, for example, will give us a nice dry beer. Whereas if we go further to the right, towards the British Isles there, they have a lower attenuation rate and they will actually give us a sweeter beer. You could also use this Californian common yeast and that would give you something different altogether. So really, as you can see, this honey beer is very, very much what you want it to be within the guidelines that I've given you. So I've collected all of my wort now and I've checked my gravity and everything's just great. Personally I decided to use the New World Strong Owl Yeast. I particularly like this one. When you decide to do this recipe, perhaps let me know which yeast you chose and why. It's all interesting stuff. So I've now added a brew belt to the fermenter and everything is going well. Just to let you know, the reason I use this bottle is to actually stretch the brew belt to make sure it has a nice tight fit and can do its job properly. There's no other reason for it, just that. So the next step in actually finishing this honey beer is actually to add the honey. Yeah, I know. We need honey in it. So in order to showcase this honey, particularly its flavour, we need to add this after the highest point of fermentation. So let me explain what that is. So generally speaking, when you first pitch your yeast into your beer, you're going to wait some hours before you start to see activity. Invariably, the first day is going to be fairly slow, and then it will start to increase. Then you have what I call the thunder period, where everything is going totally haywire. It will do that for a period and then it will start to die down. When it starts to die down, 
This is after high fermentation, and in this case, this is when we're going to add our honey to the beer. By adding the honey to the beer at this point, you will get the most flavour. Plain and simple. The other important thing that must be mentioned at this point is the quality of the honey is absolutely essential to the end result that you're going to get in your beer. If you possibly can, use raw honey from a beekeeper. If not, avoid that cheap rubbish honey you get in the supermarkets. It's just sugar. So there you have it. I hope you found this video both useful and interesting. So if you did like this video then please do go ahead and like it on YouTube. This really helps me out and allows the videos to be seen by a wider audience on YouTube. I've got a lot of videos in the pipeline for the future so if you're interested in uh, seeing what I've got coming up then please subscribe for future content. If you have any questions on anything that I've covered in this video or in others or anything to do with brewing in general then please do not hesitate to get in touch. I'm more than happy to help. Until then, happy brewing!